You ready to do some questions? All right, let's get to them. Some SATA questions. SATA questions. Now, remember, with SATA questions, we are focusing on using our common sense. We use a lot of common sense with SATA questions. Um, don't always, I mean, you can, but um, don't always think, did I learn that? Think, does it make sense? Is it contraindicated? Those are the things you should be thinking with SATA questions and turn each item into a true false question. So let's go ahead and get started with our first question. I need to see it here. So here we go. The health care provider prescribes these actions for a client who was admitted with acute substernal chest pain. Which actions are appropriate to assign to an experienced LPN who's working in the emergency department. Select all that apply. So when we're talking about delegation to an LPN or a UAP, the question that's being asked is, do you know what these people are legally allowed to do? And so that is the question. Are they allowed to do it? And are they allowed to do it based on the lowest level of education, lowest level of education? that they can get because you never assume additional education unless they tell you they have it. So you never assume, for example, that an LVN has IV certification. So an LVN can do anything except, LVNs can do anything except they cannot assess, they cannot care plan, they cannot teach, they cannot do IVs, they cannot do consults. So those are the five things that you are going to say, well, I, they can do anything except these five things. And you have to know that because those are key words. LVNs, LPNs, they can remind, they cannot teach. They can remind, they cannot teach. They can reinforce, they can't teach. But remind is the word I see used more often than reinforce. And they can monitor they can check and they can observe, but they can't not assess. Those are the key words. Talked about it in other videos, so if you need to hear it again, go back and review some of those other videos. But those are the key words. They cannot assess, but they can monitor, observe, and check. I hope that's what I said. All right, so let's look at the, at the options. Attaching cardiac monitor leads. Well, attaching cardiac monitor to leads is not assessing, care planning, teaching, consulting, or doing an IV, so we're going to pick it. B, giving heparin IV, absolutely not. It's IV, they cannot do that. C, administering morphine sulfate IV, absolutely not. They cannot do that. Obtain a 12-lead ECG, okay? That's not assessing, care planning, teaching, or consulting, or IVs, so we're going we're gonna to let them do it. That's fine. Uh, e, asking the client about pertinent medical history. Okay, we didn't talk about asking, did we? But we did say they can't do an assessment, and they cannot do a complete head-to-toe assessment. And the admission history and physical is the complete head-to-toe assessment that you do on admission. So asking them about their history is a part of that admission assessment, so we are not going to pick it, okay? We are not going to pick it because asking their history is a part of that head-to-toe admission, history, and physical. F, having the client chew and swallow aspirin. Looks like it's PO. Obviously, chew and swallow is PO, and they can do PO meds, so we are going to pick it. So the correct answers are A, D, and F. That's it. A, D, and F. Next question. The nurse is monitoring an infant with meningitis for signs of decreased intracranial pressure. The nurse should assess the infant for which signs and symptoms. SATA. All right, gosh, decreased intracranial pressure. Who knows anything about that? Not me. So if it said increased intracranial pressure, I would probably be able to guess pretty well. I don't know. Like if I'm taking this, I'm like, I don't know. Is decreased intracranial pressure different or not? So since I'm not quite sure, what I do is I say, well... I'm going to look for neurosymptoms and things that I think of as 
neuro issues, like brain neuro issues, okay? So when I think brain neuro issues, I think of headache, I think of vomiting, uh, I think of um, personality changes, maybe some memory changes, I don't know. Those are just some things I think of. But the key thing is we've got an infant. Now, the interesting thing is that when you have an age in the question, you should pay attention to it. Usually, if they give you an age in the question, the age of the patient has some bearing on the answers. And this is an infant, so we have to think about that, okay? So first, let's look and see what neurosymptoms we have here. Well, let's even see if there are any neurosymptoms. Maybe I'm confused about what they're asking me. Irritability. Oh, okay. That sounds like something that would neuro. Headache. Oh, yeah, see, that's what I was saying. Headache, yeah, sounds good. Mood swings, yeah. Okay, good. Bulging fontanelles. Well, that's neuro, but this is decreased intracranial pressure. So I'm thinking not bulging fontanelles. I, th I would think they would be like sunken fontanelles, not bulging. So I'm, I'm thinking and I'm not going to pick D, an emesis. Okay, A, B, C, and E all sound like good neuro symptoms. So if this were an adult, I would pick all those. But if this, this is an infant. So now I have to think, since I know the age and the question has significance or bearing on the answer often, I have to think, well, which of these symptoms could an infant demonstrate or exhibit? Well, an infant can demonstrate irritability. So I'm going to pick that one. Can an infant demonstrate a headache? I mean, they can have a headache, but there's no way I can know if they have a headache. And it's saying, what would you assess for? And since I cannot know if they have a headache, I can't pick it because I can't monitor, I can't assess for that. Mood swings. Well, irritability in an infant is understandable, but mood swings, that's more of a subjective thing. Sub like, you know, I was feeling really happy and now I'm really sad or whatever, but I'm not thinking an infant can show mood swings or at least not, we can't assess for those. Irritability, yes, but not mood swings. We already said we're not going to pick fault, bulging fontanelles, an emesis. Can an infant demonstrator um, exhibit emesis? Of course they can. So based on the fact that it's a neuro and in an infant, I am only going to pick A and E. So, you know, one of the big uh, mistakes that a lot of NCLEX test takers make is that they assume they are going to just know the answer to questions. And if they read a question and they don't just know it, they go, oh, I'm stupid. I'll know. Oh, I bet everybody else around here taking this test knows the answer. I don't. I'm the only one who doesn't know the answer to this question. Okay, nobody else knows the answer to this question either. <laughs> Okay, don't think like that. That's not the way to think. The vast majority of the questions that you get, you are not going to know the answer to. Not like that. Now, you can figure it out like I just did. You can reason through it. And you have to use general principles that you understand. When did you learn how to do a neuro assessment? Way back in your like fundamentals of nursing assessment class, right? And you learned about signs and symptoms of neuro problems. And, and you learned that a long time ago. This is not rocket science that we're talking about here. Don't make it into rocket science. Is there sometimes rocket science questions? Sure, you can get rocket science questions. I mean, not li literally, you know what I'm saying. But like, sure, you can get some tough questions. But these, these are not rocket science questions, so don't make it into it. But don't assume that just because it's fundamental doesn't mean you're just immediately going to know the answer. So you got to think through it, use your clinical reasoning. All right, next question. The nurse is planning care for a client with a spinal injury. Ugh, ugh. I don't like spinal injury questions. Who is to remain on complete bed rest? Okay. What should the nurse do to prevent, oh, the development of pressure ulcers? Okay, so that's not quite as confusing to me, right? You read that and you go, I, I know how to prevent pressure ulcers. They're on complete bed rest. Turn the patient every two hours. That sounds good. Insert an indwelling urinary catheter, maybe. Monitor the serum albumin. Albumin is an indicator of uh, protein level in the body and, and nutrition. So if the, if the albumin level is low, they're poorly nourished, which means they cannot heal from anything. So I'm thinking albumin may be something I want to do. Monitor the state of the white blood cell count. I mean, white cell count indicates infection. And as far as I know, a pressure ulcer, unless it tells me it's infected, a pressure ulcer is just an ulcer. It's not an infection. I mean, it can get infected, but it's not an infection. So I'm thinking no. Request a prescription for a pressure mattress. Oh, I like that. Inspect the skin for redness. Oh, I like that. 
All right, so I definitely like A, E, and F, A, and C. I definitely like A, C, E, and F. Now I gotta figure out B, insert it into dwelling catheter, because it's, you know, I've been a nurse for a long time, and we used to insert catheters to prevent skin breakdown. <laughs> like 20 years ago, we were doing that. But then we realized that this causes UTIs, and that's a problem, so we stopped doing it. So the question is, should I insert an indwelling catheter for this patient? Well, it says, what should the nurse do to prevent the development of pressure ulcers? Okay, well, you might say, well, they have a spinal injury. That's true. But do we insert pressure ulcers, do we insert catheters to prevent pressure ulcers? Now, we insert catheters when someone has a a pressure ulcer and it's not healing and they're really incontinent and it's just not healing, right? Like we can, we can sometimes put them in so that the patient can heal from a deep tissue injury or a deep pressure ulcer, but we don't put them in to prevent. In fact, that is a fundamental principle. This is a fundamental question. And they're asking you, do you know you don't put catheters in to prevent pressure ulcers? That's what they're testing you here. And if you pick B, you're missing a fundamental principle. If I ask you, just said to you, would you put a catheter in to prevent pressure ulcers? You would probably say, well, no, of course I wouldn't do that. I know you don't do that. Okay, then why would you do it here? Well, they have spinal injury. So that's not what, the, first of all, that's not what they're asking you. Secondly, you don't know this, if the spinal injury is causing urinary retention. You don't know that. It doesn't tell you that. It just says they have a spinal injury. So if you choose to put a urinary catheter in because the spinal injury, you're reading an awful lot into this question. You're saying, well, they could have urinary retention. They could, but if you insert a catheter for urinary retention, you're not putting it in to prevent the development of a pressure ulcer. So do you see how you can get really off track here if you choose insert an indwelling catheter? You're getting really off track here. You're thinking, whew, you're going out in the woods. You're going... Well, it could, you know, it could happen. Well, okay, lots of things could happen. But we don't answer questions based on what could be. We answer questions based on what we know to be. And what we know is that you don't put in catheters to prevent skin breakdown. So the question on this one, or answers, sorry, A, C, E, and F. All right, next question. The charge nurse assigns the nursing care of a patient who has just returned from open carpal tunnel release surgery to an experienced LPN. Who will perform under the supervision of an RN? Which instructions would the RN provide for the LPN? So there's two components to this. Is the LPN allowed, legally allowed to do what we are assigning them? That's the first question. The second question, is it appropriate for post-carpal tunnel surgery? Okay, so those are the two questions. You have to answer them both. Let's first answer whether the LPN is allowed to do, do it, Okay. Check the patient's vital signs. Well, they're allowed to check, right? They can check, monitor, and observe. So they can do A. So we're going to leave it on the list. B, check the dressing. Well, they can check stuff. So we're going to leave it on the list. Elevate the patient's hand above the heart. Well, they're allowed to do that. That's not assess, care plan, uh, teach, whatever, whatever, right? It's not, none of those things. So we, we're going to leave it on the list. The patient, let's see, what does the question say again? What instructions would the RN provide for the LPN? that the patient will no longer need pain medication. Well, I suppose that, I suppose that's something that the LPN can do. I mean, if we're just saying, can the LPN do this, yes or no, then D is something the LPN can do, that's fine. E, check the neurovascular status. Okay, they can do that. Instruct the patient to perform range of motion on the affected wrist. Well, that, instruct the patient. Instruct, it doesn't say teach. I guess they could do that because all it's doing is telling them to do it. It's not teaching them anything. It's just instructing them. So the word instruct is okay with me for LPNs. All right. So they're all okay for the LPN to do. Now we have to ask the question, is it appropriate for uh, carpal tunnel? And there's two things to think of. First of all, you have to know general good post-op care. What is good post-op care? Well, vital signs, check the dressing, uh, monitor for pain, um, monitor for bleeding, um, make sure that, you know, there's no complications from the surgical site. So those are things that is just general routine post-op care. It doesn't matter if it's carpal tunnel or not. Okay, so 
again, you're going to use good common sense when you're answering this question. Check the patient's vital signs every 15 minutes. So we already know the LPN can do this. Is this appropriate postcarpal tunnel? Well, it's a surgery, so I'm picking it. Check the dressing for drainage and tightness. Well, we already know the LPN can do it. Is it okay postcarpal tunnel? Well, yeah, it's a surgery. It's good post-op care. We're going to check it. We're going to do it. Elevate the patient's hand above the heart. Well, we already know the LPN can do it. Is it okay to do this after carpal tunnel? Well, if you don't know what carpal tunnel surgery is, it's an incision right here in the wrist, open up to release the nerve, right? And so what's the risk after any surgery? What is one of the most common risks is basic fundamental nursing? It's swelling, right? Swelling is a risk after surgery. So would we put it above the heart? Sure, why not? It can reduce swelling. Use your common sense. Do not throw your common sense out the window when you're doing SATA questions. So we're going to pick C. All right, tell the patient they will no longer need pain medication. Standard post-op care is medicate for pain. That is standard assess, monitor for pain, medicate for pain. That's standard post-op care. So are we going to tell them they no longer need pain? No, 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 no. That's not good post-carpal tunnel. Crossing D off. Check the neurovascular status of the fingers. Okay, that sounds like good post-op care. That's just assessing, right? Just doing good. I mean, not assessing, sorry, checking. <laughs> Post-op care, we're checking, we're not assessing, because LVNs can check, not assess. All right. E, so we're going to pick it. Instruct the patient to perform range of motion. Well, on the affected wrist. Well, we've got this incision right here. Do we really want to do a lot of range of motion here? If you don't know this, this is the only answer that's specific to carpal tunnel. All the others are general post-op. This one's specific to carpal tunnel. Carpal tunnel, they do wear a brace over their wrist to prevent a lot of movement until it heals up. So we are not going to do F. So the correct answer is A, B, C, and E. Last question. The nurse transfers a multigravit, ugh, maternity. Multigravit means they've had more than one baby or been pregnant more than one time. Who is at 25 weeks gestation? Now, I always pay attention to how many weeks they are along. When I read a maternity question, always. 25 weeks, they are preterm. 25 weeks is early in the third trimester. I don't want them to deliver at this time. So that's what I'm thinking, right? That's just immediately, I think, 25 weeks, okay, preterm, they should not be in labor. Oh, with preeclampsia, okay. To the obstet um, They're transferring from the obstetrical intensive care unit to the antenatal unit. What should the nurse include in the transfer report to, this, to safely manage his client? Okay, so you do have to know something about preeclampsia for this one, and I would definitely recommend knowing preeclampsia for the NCLEX. Lots of potential preeclampsia questions. Preeclampsia is um, life-threatening hypertension that causes damage to the kidneys which allows protein to be filtered, which normally protein is too large of a molecule to be filtered. Normally there's no protein in the urine. And so you, pick, you can pick up the fact that they are preeclampsic by finding protein in the urine. So they have protein in the urine and edema. So, and it's, it's because of the loss of protein. When you lose protein, um, you have some fluid shifting issues. I'm not gonna get into all of that right now. You can learn about that if you want to, but... Um, Anyway, so that's what preeclampsia is, okay? So you think, well, okay, what, what do we need to know? If we're, if we're transferring them, what do we want to tell them? Record of blood pressure trends. Well, preeclampsia is life-threatening hypertension, so absolutely. Record of urine protein. It's a symptom. It's a, it is a definitive sign of preeclampsia, urine protein. So definitely, I want to report that. Edema characteristics, another definitive sign of preeclampsia. This is essentially a question that's saying, do you know what the symptoms of preeclampsia are? That's basically what it's asking you. A, B, and C are the definitive symptoms of preeclampsia. I'm picking all of them. Client use of dietary sodium. Okay. I realize that sodium is something we think about with hypertension, but not preeclampsia. It is not a risk factor for preeclampsia, so we're not going to pick it. Fetal position. Now, here is where the weeks pregnant comes into play here. They are 25 weeks gestation. The baby's position is going to change many, many times before they actually reach full term. They've got 11 weeks left to go. And that baby is very small at this point and could turn. 
uh, a lot. So in fact, it will turn a lot. So we don't care what the fetal position is at 25 weeks. We are not going to pick that. Fetal heart rate pattern. All right. Fetal heart rate pattern, you know what? Unless it's clearly not applicable for the question, if mom is pregnant and you have the opportunity to check the fetal heart rate, I do it. Uh, because when you're working maternity, you have two patients. And the only way to know how baby is doing is by looking at the fetal heart monitor. That's the only way to know how baby's doing. So um, when you're working maternity, if you have the opportunity to check, check the fetal heart monitor, do it because that's the only way you can know how baby's doing. So the correct answer is A, B, C, and F. F, yep, that's right. Okay, so another SATA video is um, finished. And we will be doing more. It's sad a month here at Clinic Reviews. So we'll be doing more videos. I hope you have a great rest of your week.